Did you ever dread the first day of school? Mr. Devon, Noel, Giesler, please raise your hand. Can, can I die now? It's Ms. Devin, Noel, Geisler. I hated the first day of school because every class period, I had to endure the same ear pain again and again. If you wince when you hear your name misspoken, imagine what happens when we fail to pronounce the names of our ancestors. Don't make your ancestors cringe! Howdy, my name is Devin Noel Lee, and today I will help you help your readers dive into their family history without wincing or struggling with unfamiliar names and places. Before we continue, be sure to check out the link in the description box for additional training to help you write non-boring family histories. Do you know how to say this name? I hope so. That's my name. <laughs> how about this one? Unless you can identify that language and then speak it, you might have a wee bit of trouble. But here's the biggest question of all. Will your readers know how to say those names? How can we prevent irritating our ancestors when writing family histories about them? You have two options if you have a handful of unfamiliar words and then another option if you have multiple unfamiliar words. First, you could use footnotes. Notice the small number in the text above. It's called a superscript and it's an associated with a note at the bottom of the page. This is a reference to how to pronounce the Norwegian word so that does not disrupt the reading flow. If you're writing for a general audience, these footnotes work best if you place your genealogy citations at the end of a chapter or a book so corrections and pronunciations are the only things that show up at the bottom of a page. If your reader knows how to pronounce this Norwegian word, they will skip the reference. If they do not, a quick look at the bottom of the page will provide the pronunciation so they can continue happily reading. When writing stories for an academic audience, then you can include your pronunciation reference in the mix of your citations at the bottom of a page. The next technique is called in-text assistance. Actually, a more correct term is parenthetical references, but I like the simplified in-text assistance a little bit better. The term you use is not as relevant as what are you doing for your readers. Wait, uh, I'm not sure how to say that name. Oh, thank you, author, for including this pronunciation. So the name is pronounced Honoré Felipe Valle, who was born on the 20th of June, 1779, and the story continues. As you're writing about an ancestor, whenever you include a name or a place that might be unfamiliar, insert a pronunciation within parentheses. Do this the first time the name or place appears in your story. There might be times you will want to insert the pronunciation a second time in a lengthier book, but we can discuss that in the comment section if you wish. Your readers, particularly young ones, will be very familiar with this technique. So take advantage of it. Now, which one should you use? As with every writing decision in the editing phase, not the drafting phase, the techniques you use depend on two things. One, who your audience is, and two, your personal preferences. <laughs> Do not determine your audience until after you have completed your first draft. Once you have a general idea of the material you have to work with, then you can decide your audience and which one will benefit from your story. I will note that I tend to mark up my drafts with footnotes and com comments, something I explained in this video. Once I determined my audience and enter the formatting phase of the writing process, then I make sure I consistently use one pronunciation technique or the other. And that way I know I'm being consistent instead of trying to rely on it during the writing phase. Here are a few tips that might help guide your decision. Young 
readers are familiar with in-text pronunciations thanks to their school textbooks. Older general audience members do not like their text interrupted if they know how to pronounce something. Therefore, superscripts work better. Academic readers will appreciate either version, so either your personal preferences will guide you or whatever guidelines you receive from an organization that you may publish your story with. If you found these two suggestions helpful, please hit the like button and leave a comment now. And then continue watching this video. What happens if you have a story that has more than a handful of unfamiliar place names? If you read the story Princess of the Sword by Lynn Curlin, you would struggle with names that look <laughs> like these. <laughs> oh my heck, I don't know how to say these names. While I enjoyed reading this novel with my teens, we struggled to enjoy it fully because we didn't know how to pronounce these fantasy names. I looked for pronunciation guides and there was none online. However, for Game of Thrones fans, entire wikis are dedicated to helping you know how to say the various unfamiliar person and place names. <laughs> In the article, Does Your Story Need a Pronunciation Guide? Fred Wayworth suggests creating a pronunciation guide when there are enough words sprinkled throughout the book that the reader is going to stumble over them. This list, if extensive enough to require a list, is either a list of made up obscure or foreign words that the average reader may or may not want to learn how to pronounce. Since we're writing family history, a pronunciation guide would include an obscure or foreign words that a reader may not be familiar with. For instance, if you're writing a book in English, but your ancestors are from a non-English speaking country, you will likely need a pronunciation guide. One of my workshop students had this list of Norwegian names. I found myself either making up my own words for this paragraph to make it readable or skipping the names entirely. So the story now sounds like this in my mind. When Sven was born on May 28th in AAA Norway, his father, Papa Anderson, was 38, his mother was 36, his brother Anders was 8. AAA is a neighbor to Parish V. His parents were tenant farmers who lived at the farm Oslash. Yeah, I don't know. That's really what we want our readers to be reading. Since I wanted to hear and use the actual words of the stories, I attempted to use Google Translate or other services for assistance. Sadly, I only discovered how to pronounce a few of the words on the list. So what should we do? <laughs> Get help. That's what we should do. The best source for knowing how to say family names is to talk to your family members. If you do not have ancestors to speak with, reach out to native speakers. Finding them can be challenging, so start with these two options. First, seek out persons in your community through Facebook groups or online social groups to see if anyone speaks the language. Then ask them. Or seek out native speakers in genealogy communities or societies both online and off. You could also contact your local library for suggestions on what community resources are available for learning that language. Thanks to viewers like you, I reached out and found help from Anna Corinne. She kindly made a video for me to hear the spoken words. <laughs> Thank you so much! I did my best to write phonetically what I heard her say. It looks like this. Now, I am hearing impaired, so I might have misheard her. Hopefully, someone will offer a better pronunciation reference if I did make a mistake. If you want to learn how to write phonetically, I will have several links on the blog post listed in the description box for this video to help you know, well, actually, how do you write it phonetically? Please consider adding pronunciations to your book. There are a couple of things this will do for you. As I've mentioned earlier, it will help your reader find out how to say the names and places that cannot be easily found online or in a reference book. 
it can help a hearing impaired person like myself understand the sounds people are saying. And it can make your story more enjoyable because your readers stumble less on unfamiliar words. I could offer more tips on creating a pronunciation guide and what words to include, but I will leave a few other tips in that blog post that I re reference that's on my blog. Or we can talk about it in the comments section. I'm okay with that too. <laughs> and if there's enough interest, we can do a follow-up tutorial. Thanks for watching. Please consider subscribing to this channel. And if you're ready for the next writing tip, check out this video right up there.